Welcome everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast, where I look to distill the best practices and best ideas of the world's most successful families and their family offices. I hope to provide thought-provoking opinions and feature amazing thought leaders to our listeners of the podcast with an eye towards the future of the family office. Today's podcast is titled, Maximizing Your Family's Health and Navigating COVID-19, featuring Dr. Sanjay Patil. Dr. Patil is a board certified cardiologist and technologist. He completed his cardiology fellowship at Harvard Medical School and earned an MS in clinical research and design and biostatistics from the University of Michigan, and also an MS in Health Information Technology from MIT. What's more, Dr. Sanjay Patil is a clinical leader and visionary who is actively revolutionizing healthcare using Internet of Things technology, uh, genomics, big data, which we'll get to, and novel business model. So we're really excited. We're in the midst of COVID-19. We're early summer to get people who may hear this, well, technically late spring. We're in mid-June, so summer is about nine or 10 days away. But to give you some context, because things are changing so quickly with COVID, and who knows when people will hear this, whether it's on a podcast in a month or in a year, it's very important to give context to our date, which by the way, to be really exact, happens to be June 12th. We're really excited to have Dr. Patil on. Not only does he have an amazing uh, career in terms of being a doctor and really understanding a lot of the issues with COVID-19, he's an entrepreneur, a technologist, uh, and really understands from the business perspective and opportunities potentially uh, for families looking to invest in the space and be impactful. So we have a really diverse discussion today. We look forward to it being very engaging and why don't we begin? First of all, Dr. Patel, welcome so much to the show. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to have you here. So, I mean, wow, I, I almost don't know where to start. So we're not gonna go back to the beginning because I think everyone knows a little bit of the earlier story uh, of COVID-19. And we also have covered it a, a fair amount relatively in my podcast, but it probably has been about a month or so. So I'm in the greater New York City area the epicenter of the US, where effectively I've been quarantined for about three months, uh, just about 99.9%, .9%, and things are just starting to get better, to open up. You know, they're going through certain phases here in Lower Connecticut, again, a suburb of New York City. So the question I'm gonna begin with is, is COVID-19 fading away so far as we enter the early summer? So I don't think it, we've seen the worst of it. Um, unfortunately, we have seen the early surge and New York certainly was, was uh, you know, an example of that early surge. Um, because there were steps taken in order to reduce the spread, we've seen that surge actually begin to die down. Surprisingly, it's leveled off and I hate to use this particular metric, but uh, it, it is quite sobering. Even in New York City today, or New York, New York State, you're looking at 80 people dying every day of COVID-19. And those are the cases that we know about. That's obviously down from the several hundred every day, but it is by no means over. Uh, New York's numbers are very similar to California's numbers, where you have 50 to 80 people, dying every day from COVID-19 infections. So we see that the early steps that were taken to try and reduce the risk of spread and to reduce the impact on the hospital infrastructure, that has effectively worked, but we have now plateaued. It has not gone away by any stretch of the imagination. And there is serious concern that there will be a late summer bump again. And we're certainly going to get to that. So staying on again a little bit more in my New York area, I believe it peaked with, if I factor that as deaths, on April 12th or 13th in New York. And again, has gotten much better than the horrific number 
that it was. But really, again, in any sort of thing like this, even one person is too much. I do understand that. Uh, due to social distancing, mask, quarantining, and better, whatever, hand washing, uh, no shaking hands. Again, it has gotten better in greater New York, which was the worst. It does give a feeling that things are kind of opening up again, but your statement was very blunt. We've not seen the worst of it. That is what you said. What is happening in other parts of the country where basically they're completely open, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, off the top of my head, do we see the numbers increasing significantly? Yeah, unfortunately, you're seeing a surge in Texas right now that they're attributing to Memorial Day weekend uh, festivities. Uh, there is this outbreak, if you will, in Arizona as well. And so, you know, these areas where, uh, let me take a step back. So open versus closed, shelter in place, lockdown, all these phrases, right? What were they? There were attempts by either state or county governments to try and reduce the risk of spread. Why? There is no definitive treatment. There is no cure. There is no vaccine. Without taking these steps, different parts of the country are going to be affected to uh, varying extents. Why is that? You don't have an equivalent number of hospital beds relative to the population. There aren't sufficient ICU beds in high population density markets to really meet the demand. So part of the reason that there was the shall we call it a lockdown or quarantine process, was really to reduce the impact on the hospital infrastructure. We didn't have enough PPE, we didn't have enough hospital beds, we didn't have enough ICU beds. People, many more people would have died had the steps not been taken. So in the other parts of the country, we're actually seeing not quite an explosion, but the surge, and it is extremely worrisome. Uh, Anthony Fauci. Brilliant man, absolute, absolute, brilliant scientist, gentleman. I had the great good fortune to uh, you know, meet him at a TED Met a few years ago. He echoes these same concerns that we're in for another surge, whether it's late summer or early fall, we're in for a very bad winter. Um, why is that? When there's cold and flu season, how do we know that that cough or that fever is or isn't COVID. So you're going to see this onslaught again and taxing of the healthcare infrastructure in various high population density markets, namely New York, Miami, Illinois, specifically Chicago, uh, certainly Northern and Southern California. So we are seeing this uh, come back up very rapidly in, in markets that are quote unquote open. Are we seeing an increase more in those open markets? And again, I'm just asking for being curious and a little bit of my lack of knowledge because simply people are more aware of it. They're getting testing when they have symptoms. Is simply greater testing making the numbers inflated compared to less testing two months ago? But my bigger question, that was more of the sidebar. If I judge it strictly, and maybe I'm jaded by New York getting so much better, by hospitalizations and deaths, it does appear to be getting better. But again, I, I, I wanna understand, should I judge it only by percentage of hospitalization increases every day and every week in deaths? I mean, that seems logical. So let's, uh, let's address it you know, in the sequence that uh, you, you just brought up. It's definitely getting better, right? It has gotten better, but better is a relative term. If you have a forest fire and it's burning really out of control, couple of different things happen. Either all the wood that can be burnt is burnt, or there are certain steps that have been taken to try and reduce the spread of that fire. What wound up happening, and I'm using sort of an analogy or a metaphor, if you will. In New York, the virus spread dramatically. It incubated, and then we saw this incredible surge, right? When steps were taken to try and reduce the risk of spread, mitigate that risk, we then began to see the curve peak and then come down. 
So it is most definitely better. The big concern is as we open up, we don't know definitively in high concentration, high population density markets, whether these measures are going to be sufficient. And it is counterbalanced, the reality. It's counterbalanced against the need to have an economy that's functional, right? We can't have people for six months really sheltering in place, not being able to go to work, and the engine of prosperity, namely the consumer economy, is completely, completely in a, in a straitjacket, for lack of a better term. So it is getting better. Um, there are unclear statistics vis-a-vis -vis testing. We are clearly identifying more cases, no question. So if you balance it out, early on when we didn't have as much testing, we had the surge of cases. Right now we have much more testing capability available. We are still seeing those cases. So on the whole, it's definitely better. The concern is, is, it, is the forest fire going to erupt again on parts of the forest that haven't been burnt out? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. And again, we're going to stay on COVID-19 because I think your information is great and I want the audience to really understand it. Let's stay a little bit on testing. So we heard about COVID-19 testing at the point of care. Can you tell us about the different tests and uh, effectively treatments available? Uh, test, PCR, antibody, please. Sure. Um, there are several different kinds of tests. I'm just going to break it down into two broad categories. One that detects the virus. Do you actually have the virus either in your nose, your throat, or your saliva? There's another category of test that determines if you have antibodies to the virus. The presence of antibodies simply means that you've been exposed at some point. It's too early to determine if the presence of antibodies gives you what we call durable immunity. What does durable immunity mean? You can have an illness, you can recover from it, and because you've got neutralizing antibodies, those neutralizing antibodies protect you from a reinfection for a certain period of time. If you look at vaccinations in young children, you, know, you get two or three doses at a time because what you're trying to do is stimulate what we call durable immunity, right? COVID-19 has been around for a very short period of time. No one really knows if the presence of antibodies confers durable long-term immunity. There is quite a bit of evidence that antibodies are neutralizing antibodies and they are helpful. We just don't know how long the body will continue to create those. What is that evidence? the fact that you can actually give immune plasma, someone who's recovered from the virus, mm -hmm. you can take that plasma, the antibodies, and give it to someone who is infected and in extremis, so to speak. <clears throat> so antibody testing simply tells you whether you've been exposed. It does not tell you definitively if you have durable immunity. Why do we make this statement? We have seen instances where an individual is infected with the virus, they have virus in their nose, they recover, and I'll use air quotes for that, they recover, and a few weeks later, they have the same symptoms and they test positive for the virus again, despite the presence of antibodies. So bottom line, antibodies denote exposure. They don't necessarily denote whether you are truly immune from a reinfection. The other kind of test is a test looking for the virus itself. The virus is what we call an RNA virus. It has all these different genes in it. Most of the tests, whether they're point of care testing, PCR based testing or sequencing, these look for specific patterns of genes. You don't look for one particular gene, right? Um, the analogy that I would give you is if I showed you a picture of an animal and all I showed you was a hoof, is it a horse? Is it a zebra? Is it something else with a hoof? You can't really tell. So these tests that are PCR based tests look for three or more genetic characteristics that are unique to the virus itself. And if you've got those, then in all likelihood, you're carrying the 
the COVID-19 virus. PCR-based testing, you get a swab, whether it's from the throat, the nose, saliva, whatever the case may be. They then look to see if there are a certain number of viral particles in that sample. That's a test that needs to go to a lab. They run the test over a period of anywhere between three and eight hours, and they're usually run in batches of 100 at a time. So you get those results usually in about a day from the time that they hit the lab, if the lab has the throughput and the capacity. There are point of care tests, which also detect what is referred to as viral antigen, okay? They're not looking for the RNA, they're looking for the protein that denotes that this virus is present. Those point of care tests, I take a swab, put it in the cartridge, run it in the machine, the machine takes between five and seven minutes to say positive or negative. That's pretty good. You get a result almost instantaneously. Only challenge, those machines really take five to seven minutes to detect. You've got to then clean, get ready for the next cartridge. So you're looking at between four and six or seven tests per hour on the point of care testing. So if you've got a busy, busy you know, workplace or a busy, busy clinic, the point of care testing is limited by the volume that it can handle. There's a third type of test that literally just got announced the day before yesterday on the 10th of June. The FDA approved a company called Illumina that makes what are called genome sequencers. Illumina's NovaSeq 6000 equipment is able to process 3,000 samples in 24 hours, and it looks for, I think it was either 12 or 18 different genes on the virus. This is amazing. It is incredible. Not only because you can do incredible volume in a rapid period of time, but you're detecting almost every single important gene in that virus and the mutations. Beyond a, a science experiment, where is this potentially applicable? If you've got a workforce that needs to go back to work and needs to be free of disease, and you need to test them on a regular basis, this is vitally important to have that sort of testing capacity available. From a public health and mutation perspective, you need to know when the virus mutates, to what extent it's mutated, what strain is present in New York versus Northern California versus Southern California. It's going to be very, very important when you select out of these I don't know what the number is these days, 124 vaccine candidates, right? You've got to know what's going to work in what market. So this is where big data and information, uh, artificial intelligence really comes in. It's not enough to do things the old way, which is create a vaccine for a virus, have one or two vi uh, vaccine candidates, and you know, cross your fingers and hope that it works over five years. We don't have that luxury. And a, a lot of questions. So earlier on in New York, which again was kind of the epicenter, the hospitals were overburdened. Again, thankfully that's gotten better. Uh, the ventilator issue, and I didn't really understand the ventilator until <laughs> during COVID. And you know, your chance of recovering from being on a ventilator is a scary like thirty percent. It 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 wasn't too optimistic. So. Basically, my question is, given that we've been going through this for three months, and I know there's not a, a treatment per se, there's some drugs that show promise, but given that the medical professionals have learned and gotten better, if that's the right word, how, do we need to get people on a ventilator as much as we thought we did or are we learning that we're better off keeping them off the ventilator as long as we possibly could? And some of the meds showing promise, maybe we should start to take them earlier. Um, so multi-part answer. <laughs> yes. Um, so there is a decent amount of evidence coming out of the New York experience and the Massachusetts experience that people can come in and they may seem reasonably normal and within one to two hours, their oxygen saturation falls precipitously. And we're talking about 20, 30, 40 year olds. We're not talking about, you know, the notion that COVID is a disease that gets the elderly and the immunocompromised. We're talking about hale, hardy, young people decompensating within one to two hours in an emergency room 
and without a ventilator, they're dead. So the short answer is we need to really understand what predisposes individuals to a severe response to the disease. What we are seeing is this concept of inflammation. I'm sure all of the, the folks that are listening here are familiar with the concept of inflammation. We've, we've heard so much about that in terms of health and wellness. COVID-19 seems to trigger pathways of inflammation, particularly in the lungs. There is some evidence that it impairs the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. So this is an, you know, an almost lethal combination. If your body triggers this rapid immune response and your lungs are incapable of oxygenating and or the hemoglobin in your blood is incapable of carrying the same level of oxygen that it could because of the virus, you suffocate, you die within literally a half an hour. So the need for ventilators in specific populations, when it looks like someone is decompensating, the jury is, is not out. It's, it's pretty clear. You probably need to go ahead and get them on a ventilator quickly. Now, that's the really bad news. The good news. <clears throat> there are a number of treatments that look at immune response. They are early out there. Okay? There are trials that are, that are going on that are saying, even if you decompensate and are on a ventilator, perhaps we can actually... Uh, attenuate, right? Mitigate your risk from inflammation causing irreversible damage. So that's, that's one. The second really important finding is that plasma from donors that have survived seems to help. Again, early evidence, not a lot of good large randomized trials that prove that definitively, but that's pretty positive. And last but not least, I'm going to choose my words carefully here. Uh, there are certain oral drugs, hydroxychloroquine is not one of them, but uh, there are certain oral drugs that show great promise right now. They are not approved by the FDA for use in the United States today. Um, one of them, very much like Tamiflu for the influenza, it shows great promise in reducing the severity and the duration of symptoms, cuts it in half. So if a COVID infection leaves you symptomatic for nine to 12 days with this particular drug, it seems to cut it down to four days. And it takes the uh, time that you're shedding virus, right? That you've got virus and you're spreading it to other people cuts it down to three days in 80% of the people. Is it a silver bullet? Is it a permanent cure? No, but it appears to reduce the severity, the duration of disease, and most importantly, how long you spread the disease. No one has looked at this in terms of prophylaxis yet. So the, the jury's clearly out on, can you take this and prevent getting COVID-19? but it shows great promise that if you're positive, then you should probably take this if you don't have a reason not to. There are some concerns, obviously, uh, in pregnancy, it seems to cause quite a few, quite a few issues. Um, and then also people with liver impairment, liver function problems. But I gotta tell you, that is the brightest ray of hope that is immediately on the horizon over the next 60 to 90 days. And candidly, the science makes sense, so much so that as a company, in terms of what we do, we actually have been looking at, uh, you know, how do we go ahead and develop and scale production on this should the need arise? So there, there are some bright spots out there, but to answer your original question, no, I think we have to go ahead and put people on the ventilator rapidly. Hopefully we can get them off sooner though. That's kind of where we are. We're still learning about the disease. I compare this to the original uh, AIDS epidemic or HIV. We kept learning. Over a period of two to three years, we learned more and more and more. Right now, because there is global attention on this, there isn't this, this perhaps stigma, if you will, associated with this. It affects everyone 
on every level, regardless of nationality, regardless of the ethnicity, it is impactful. So there's quite a bit of attention. A lot of money is being spent on this. There's quite a bit of interest in trying to figure out how best to manage this. Uh, one medicine that appears to be a limited use that has gotten shows promise, I'm gonna mess up its name, Rem Levesdor, uh, has that shown, it, do you need to take it earlier? Is it better in late stage? What's been the clinical research on that? Yeah. And how do you pronounce it correctly? <laughs> Remdesivir. Okay, uh, it was pretty from, close. <laughs> it's from uh, Gilead. It's an IV medication and uh, the trials that I've seen administer this to people who are in the hospital and obviously uh, very, very sick, right? They're in extremis. So it does seem to show uh, better results than say placebo, right? But you're really, really sick by the time this drug is available. Uh, I'm sorry, appropriate. And then availability is going to be an interesting challenge by itself. Um, I do think some of these oral medications that are out there, they show quite a bit more promise that you probably need to try and take those early. Again, it's premature. There isn't great scientific evidence, but there is early evidence. So the other drug that I'm referring to, that's called Favicaravir. Try and say that three times quickly. <laughs> I don't think there'll be, a, although my audience may laugh if I try. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this particular drug, uh, the uh, Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund actually invested uh, $100 million in developing capacity around this. The early trials show that it's effective in 80% of the folks who took the drug. So again, not a large randomized trial. You know, I don't want to say that there's huge solid science on this, but it's promising. I mean, if you can reduce severity and duration by 50%, sign me up. You know, I would want that if I were infected. And related to that, I read about that, uh, I think in the BBC, and what they were hopeful for, a little bit along the timeline that you said, late summer, mm -hmm. August, September, perfect world. In the US, there's multiple point of care drive-throughs where testing has gotten much, much better and much quicker. If you show positive, they give you that medication or effectively some cocktail of treatment. And again, it's not curing it per se. It doesn't mean you're not going to get it again, but it appears to be significantly better than what we have now. Is that best case scenario by August, September? I think that best case scenario, uh, um, hard for me to, to say about the technology and what becomes available. At the end of the day, technology becomes available, but then you've got to scale it and you've got to distribute it. And that's the biggest challenge right now. Point of care testing, I think you'll see much more point of care testing available by August and September, mm -hmm. no question. In terms of actual drugs that uh, you can use and are definitive uh, or, or even helpful, maybe not even definitive, August, September might be a bit early um, we're going to see these interesting challenges of, of getting drug trials, getting approval, scaling up production capacity. I can tell you that there are a lot of huge investments. I'm going to call them bets because they are bets, right? There are huge investments being made in specific viral, I'm sorry, vaccine candidates as well as drug candidates. And they are bets. Because when we go into cold and flu season, the demand is going to be unimaginable. Unimaginable. So, Well, actually, let's get a little bit into that. So better than something that could help with the symptoms, possibly a treatment, is going to be a vaccine. That's going to be the, you know, that, that, that's the optimum that we're looking for. The world is collaborating like never before, unlike the AIDS crisis, which was uh, initiated decades ago, our AI and big data, our technologies are far, far more advanced, let alone the collaboration. There's what, 126 companies working on a vaccine, about seven or eight are showing very good promise so far. Am I unrealistic in saying that we're moving at breakneck speed 
that something is going to look very, very positive with probably more than one of them as we segue into the next phase of trials and possibly some approval by the fall and wide distribution by the first quarter. Is that that, that unrealistic? So I think you'll have vaccine candidates that show promise and get early approval, certainly by the fourth quarter of this year. Um, will they be uh, candidates that we know give durable immunity? No, absolutely not. So let's, let's take, take the following sequence. If I vaccinate you today, you're part of a trial, and we look at three months out, you've been exposed in the community and you haven't actually acquired a COVID-19 infection. We've got about three months of good data that perhaps this seems to be effective. In order to say at six months, nine months, and 12 months that this is effective, we literally have to wait another six, nine, and 12 months, right? And therein lies the challenge. There will be candidates that seem to show an initial early response. We are gambling, we are, we are literally crossing our fingers saying that if it's safe to give the vaccine, uh, hopefully it should give you durable immunity, but only time will tell, right? So in terms of vaccine candidates coming to the fore within the next three to six months, absolutely, no question whatsoever. In terms of scaling and distributing I have to tell you, it's going to be quite challenging to scale and distribute. Um, if you go to uh, Bill Gates, he's got a, uh, you know, a platform uh, where he describes uh, many different topics and, and his perspective on those topics. It's called Gates Notes. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it. There's a particular um, edition where Bill Gates describes that the shortest time that we have effectively created a vaccine and distributed it wide, widely, large scale distribution has been five years, okay? We're trying to compress that into 18 months. So the original question was, you know, can we hope to see something widely distributed and scaled by the first quarter? I think we'll start seeing something being distributed. We just don't know how much it can be distributed that rapidly and how effective it'll be. Let's move over a little bit. And this is where it's, it's gonna get a little difficult because there's not really a perfect answer. It's balancing the health concerns of COVID-19 with the grave economic concerns. So you talked about the economic dislocation of COVID-19, what it has caused, uh, could that, could it have been mitigated, meaning the economic impact, by being more selective in lockdowns and quarantines? So there's a description, and I certainly won't take credit for this. Uh, I, I forget specifically who said this, but after every pandemic, you know, going into a pandemic, in the aftermath, everything that we attempt to do will either be too much or too little. In my estimation, purely from a scientific standpoint, what we did was not too much. It created incredible economic dislocation, but I think we would have seen probably three times, maybe four times as many deaths in the United States had these steps not been taken. Why was there such economic dislocation? You have population centers, right? You have these, these locations which were also economic engines for not only their states, but for the country. And the economic dislocation affected these high density population markets. That's why you're seeing as much as you did. Now, if you're in another state where there doesn't seem to be that much happening, it seems like it's overkill. Why was this, why was this undertaken? Um, if I take a step back, could it have been applied in a more judicious or targeted fashion? I honestly think no one knows what the right answer is. If we were to adopt the approach that there was a complete lockdown for one month or 45 days that was completely across the United States, which 
would never happen in, in a free state. It would never happen. Well, and it would assume. disappear. Yeah. <laughs> I actually thought about that. I mentioned that to my wife. I go, you know, because of that 14 day incubation period, in theory, if we all stayed in our home and no one was allowed to come into the country, in theory, it would go away. But again, that means no hospital workers, no police, no grocery workers. That's just not realistic. But I, I would argue the following. If we had a complete lockdown everywhere, except for what you just described, essential services, and if the appropriate precautions were taken for those essential workers. And of course, no one comes in, no one goes out, you're not spreading virus, so on and so forth. Theoretically, you could have locked this down. That's, right. again, theoretical. Is Every, that kind of what New Zealand did? Pretty much, and look at their right. results. It's pretty amazing what they did, right? Um, and you, you actually see that in other countries as well, where they've been able to effectively lock everything down. Here is our biggest challenge. Not everyone else in the world is doing the same thing. So you're going to have this influx of disease, even if we had completely locked down and, and completely isolated everything in the United States. They're going to come in from all the international, both shipments as well as passenger travel again. So the, the real strategy, in, in my opinion, needs to be a program of risk mitigation, workplace and community-based testing and contact tracing. And as soon as a drug is identified that reduces the infection rate, right? There's no good cure right now, but it reduces the infection rate. In my estimation, you get identified rapidly, you are started on this drug, you stay at home for you know, four days, seven days, whatever it is, you test negative, you can go back into the workforce. That is how you're going to be able to A, control this, and B, most importantly, allow the economy to get back to some semblance of normality, right? That's, that's what I see as the only logical conclusion before a vaccine can definitively be scaled and distributed. And related to that, and again, coming from a ignorance, I understand this, but related to the economic lockdown, as I would call it, what if you were to say those of you over 70, those of you that are immune compromised, those of you that are deemed to be obese, mainly for the purpose of the burden on your body with blood sugar and diabetes, completely be quarantined and stay at home. Now, someone could argue, Angela, with what you just mentioned, especially the obesity problem we have here in the US, it, and the other factors of immune compromised, et cetera, that probably is half of the population. So I, I realize that may not work out, but ignoring those comments, would there be some logic to that? So people that are working, that are not benefiting as much from the stimulus package in someone like me, a small business owner that is not really qualifying because of number of employees for PPP, not qualifying for unemployment. And when I drive through New York, these small businesses, pizzerias, restaurants, a, a lot of them, uh, half of them, I'm gonna say that, are not gonna reopen. They're devastated. Yeah, so I think that uh, we still should be recommending that the elderly and folks that are immunocompromised, even without economic lockdown in place, shelter in place, that's the term that's used here in California, they need to be aware and they need to stay, frankly, out of, out of the, the public eye, so to speak. Uh, they're still at risk. Just because the economy opens up or, you know, shelter in place goes away. I have to tell you, I mean, I have parents that are in their 70s and 80s, right? Uh, my mom's in her late 70s, my dad's in his 80s, and I would not want them to go out, even though restrictions are being lifted. It is far more important from a family perspective that your vulnerable populations are still, for lack of a better term, isolated. Uh, and the corollary, let's say that they are staying by themselves. They are being isolated. If, one, if I or one of my family members 
gets infected and unwittingly spreads mm -hmm. it to them. You know, we've done everyone a, a grave disservice. So I think that isolating it to the high risk population um, in terms of the economic dislocation, that, that mitigation, probably would not have worked as effectively as we would have liked. We mentioned New Zealand before, the extreme opposite, Sweden. I haven't looked recently at the statistics and maybe I'm listening to the wrong news shows, but the impression I get is, yeah, they're getting hit a little harder than some of their neighbors, but maybe it hasn't exploded as much as we would look at it and say they're basically doing so little. But what do the numbers tell us? So it's very interesting. You've got New Zealand on one hand, you've got Sweden and others like Sweden uh, who did not take those necessary steps or what were perceived to be necessary steps. If you look at Japan early on, they hadn't taken you know, these, these extreme measures and then they saw an explosion of cases, right? Um, I don't have a good answer that explains why Sweden was spared for lack of a better term. There are all sorts, of, there's quite a bit of speculation. In the United States itself, you see states where it's virtually nothing, uh, not just deaths, but virtually no hospitalizations or very limited hospitalization, limited ICU utilization, that sort of thing. There have to be other social factors and demographic factors that perhaps explain some of this. We just don't have those answers at the moment. So I wish I could give you a much more intelligent answer. It doesn't make any, any sense. There has to be something else. One of the things that I, you know, I always think about, in New York, you've got incredible population density, you've got high rises, you've got uh, ubiquitous use of public transportation. In California, you don't have, at least in Southern California, as much use of public transportation. Simply sheltering in place early, it's a bit unclear if that explains it. There are probably cultural, social, other demographic factors that we still don't fully understand. And that's where big data, call it AI if you will, but the analytics really need, need to be put into overdrive, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to understand all of these other characteristics You've got to look at the genetics of these different populations, why they seem to have fared much better than others. I think that's, that's the next logical step in trying to understand this disease. With economic disruption, there are things that are creating, I guess you could say, new opportunities. Look at a company like Zoom that was doing broadly well, and now the founders are billionaires on paper food delivery, uh, effectively big data, AI, uh, things that are helping from a remote workforce and some established brands, the Amazons, the Walmart. So there are parts of the economy doing well. It's not like 2008 with the financial crisis where everything kind of went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, so, you know, I, I hate to say a silver lining because there's great companies, and more importantly to me, great entrepreneurs, small businesses that are going to be devastated. Uh, but, you know, there are opportunities that are rising from this as well. So I think that uh, the Internet of Things, if you will, allowed for many businesses to adapt. You know, I have a colleague who uh, used to be in the Marines, and their motto is when faced with a with a challenge or an extreme situation, you adapt and overcome. There are companies that were either ideally positioned or rapidly adapted to deal with this particular challenge, right? Meal delivery was a convenience. It went from being a convenience to a necessity. If a restaurant wanted to stay in business, it needed to have a platform that they worked with in order to continue to stay in business. Amazon went from being a shop at your fingertips in the comfort of your own home or wherever you may be to a necessity. And they had designed both supply chain optimization as well as delivery optimization fulfillment 
that was their core premise. So they were prepared. Um, you know, Louis Pasteur is, is quoted as describing serendipity in the following way. Chance favors only the prepared mind. These companies, it was less candidly about big data and it was about new or novel business models. You had people who could not leave their home. You had product that needed to be delivered and people came up with solutions and platforms that permitted that. I think that that is here to stay in healthcare, telemedicine and telehealth. Before it was looked at as a convenience, perhaps it'll save some money, it became a necessity. It's here to stay. I believe that COVID-19 affected not only the United States, but the world, certainly, in a manner analogous to what happened you know, during 9-11. You never can go to the airport and look at everything the same way again. COVID-19 will force us to do that in almost every aspect of our lives, whether it's wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, uh, shaking hands, every single aspect of your life and your social interaction has changed dramatically. Yeah, I mean, on the technological front, and it's a common saying, but what was gonna happen is now gonna happen even quicker for a variety of reasons. It won't, even with the vaccine, eventually that works perfectly. Uh, and we're all gonna be concerned about what's the next novel virus that will come along. Now, maybe we'll have more experiences in healthcare. Maybe some of the medicines that will eventually work will work on that. And maybe we'll have simply biotech and uh, companies that simply could much, much quicker address these issues that this helped to spur along as a technological advancement. I'm thinking optimistically, admittingly on all of that, but related to that, biotech and AI are strong areas of investment opportunity now. And as I was reading your background to begin, and you could tell by hearing your comments now, uh, you know, you might have a little bit of experience relative to AI and applying it to healthcare and biotechnology. Tell us about the investment opportunities there. Sure. So a couple of things. AI uh, means a lot of different things. People use that to describe programmatic algorithms. They use that to describe pattern recognition. Um, you know, have you noticed that on your smartphone, when you use the camera, it seems to put a square right around the faces in the picture? That's, that's simply pattern recognition. Is that AI? Depends on who you talk to, right? AI encompasses many, many different, it's a term that's being used in the technologic space for many different applications, if you will. As I see it from the standpoint of healthcare, I'm going to just take a step back and, and look at, you know, investments. Uh, we're in the business of healthcare, right? I was asked recently by a dear, dear friend and colleague of mine, hey, with COVID-19 and everything that's happening, you know, is healthcare still a good place to invest? Does it make sense? Should we be rethinking our five-year strategy? And I said, well, it's really simple. It's still a good place as long as you are very, very targeted and very, very specific, right? COVID-19 is probably here for at least 12 to 18 months as something we have to contend with. If it becomes much like the flu, it's going to be here for much, much longer. You're going to have to get vaccinated on a regular basis based on the latest strain, the latest set of mutations. What areas of healthcare could you conceivably invest in today as well as off into the future from a long-term standpoint. Everyone hops onto the bandwagon of vaccines, right? That's great, nothing wrong with that. There's a huge need for those. Uh, there will be companies that are inordinately profitable if they come up with a, a definitive vaccine. But what, what sectors of healthcare still make sense if I'm an investor at this point? The interesting scenario is, if you're actually on the payer space, particularly on the, on the Medicare Advantage side, it's a, it's a wide open field. Because at this point, you have provider organizations that were in the traditional fee-for-service model. With COVID-19, 
you have practices that completely have to rework their operation and their revenue model. So being in the payer space, vitally, vitally important. It's strategic. Certainly when uh, you're looking at taking care of the Medicare population, which will be more than 30 million folks here over the next few years, and these are voters, right? There's no question. That's 30 million on Medicare Advantage or privatized Medicare. You've got about 60 million folks that will be on the Medicare roster itself. Separate from that, you've got the opportunity in what, what I will just refer to as generic drug manufacturing, that's going to be necessary. But if you can opportunistically go after the creation and the distribution of certain drugs that mitigate the impact of illnesses such as COVID-19, that's another key component. Generic drugs, recurring revenue, uh, margins are, are just astronomical. Just defies any explanation why you wouldn't want to. Is COVID-19 going to reduce the demand for drugs for hypertension, for high cholesterol, for diabetes? Of course it isn't. It's, it's not going to. It's, if anything, it's going to be a steady stream. In other areas, analytics and, quite frankly, testing, right? You've got to be able to acquire the data and you've got to be able to test folks. Testing for COVID-19 is not going to go away anytime soon. Although it is opportunistic, it is part of a larger strategy, if you will. Um, we've tried to create really an ecosystem of, of companies within our, our holding company model. We did not, I will tell you right up front, we did not plan for COVID-19. But we've been able to repurpose many of our capabilities and our resources in order to address the opportunities as well as the challenges that have been manifest here. So from an investment perspective, 124, 127 vaccine candidates, you know, it's kind of a gamble. You could uh, go to the races and bet on all 127 horses and hopefully, uh, you know, one or two or three of them will, will become the, the winner of uh, the trifecta. Um, I think that generic drug manufacturing continues to be vitally important. I think that government sponsored programs uh, where you get to be a payer, that continues to be vitally, vitally important. I think over the next 18 to 24 months, testing capability is vitally, vitally important. There's a huge opportunity there. Um, you know, if you're going to get control of this pandemic, you've got to test, you've got to isolate, you've got to treat as soon as a treatment is available. We're positioning ourselves, obviously, to be able to provide that. Yes, your company has certainly adapted to the times and is doing something that's very you know, beneficial as well. And I thought that was important for our audience to understand it from, uh, I guess you could say a healthcare, a biotech, and an investment perspective, given your background. Uh, there's a question we preambled a little bit on it <laughs> before you came on, and it's a question that I asked Peter Diamandis earlier in the week, and one that I'm intrigued by, given your background and how you think and make decisions. So in companies needing to adapt and move forward into a new normal, basically it comes down to a couple of different things. Historically, uh, and this is probably something Peter Drucker would have said in a different era, it really hasn't changed that much, but I think right now in COVID, perhaps it has. Is it people, ideas, and machines? Would you leave the importance of that in that order, or is COVID-19 changing the order and even replacing one of those in terms of the importance for a company to think creatively and be successful in this new world? So ideas, are critically important. It's part of the adapt and overcome. How does one overcome any challenge that uh, is manifest, right? You've got to be able to come up with not just a great idea, but obviously operationalize that. We are very fortunate. We live in a very, very different time than when polio was a disease that we were trying to eradicate. Smallpox was a disease that we were trying to eradicate. And quite frankly, when HIV first manifest in, in the 80s. 
uh, we did not have the tools at our disposal that we have today. We have got to take individuals and companies that are willing to connect the dots, right? You've got to be able to connect those dots rapidly. So the idea piece coupled with the actual execution and the execution is not just based on available technology. It's piecing together that technology and having the, the subject matter expertise, the intelligence and the vision to be able to tie all of those together. I think that's the only way we overcome something like this. Um, you know, I'm sure you've seen Steve Jobs' uh, Stanford commencement address. Of course. And, you know, he describes how he went to Reed College and uh, learned about calligraphy. Uh, no practical application in the business world ever. Beautiful, beautiful typeface, serif and sans serif. Um, and it all came back when it became time to create the first vector-based fonts for the Mac, right? This is about having people who can truly connect those dots. I'm very, 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 very fortunate to be living in the time that I'm living in. We have access to incredible technology. We have access to incredible amounts of information. And we have people that are willing to actually engage and listen. Uh, if you look at it purely from an investment standpoint, ideas are a dime a dozen. How do you execute? What's the team that you have and what's your execution plan? So ideas, I think, are still vitally, vitally important, but the people who can execute on those tech, listen, there's some tech out there that is going to solve whatever solution you need. I'll give you a, another example. So one of my other colleagues, um, we were talking about a workplace safety and contact tracing tool, right? We work with employer groups and inpatient facilities in order to regularly test both their staff as well as residents for COVID-19. In order to have a program of regular testing, testing by itself is insufficient. What happens when somebody's positive? You've got to be able to track not only who they interacted with outside, but more importantly, within the workplace in order to mitigate risk, right? How does one do that without violating someone's privacy? Everyone, you know, the default setting is download an app, use an app. Well, that kind of is a bit of a problem because you've got to turn that on. There's geolocation, there's all these different things. There's privacy considerations. So one of my colleagues brought up this interesting concept of wayfinding. On your phone, on your smartphone, if there are wayfinding beacons, they cost about two to three dollars a piece. Put that throughout your facility, whatever the facility may be, two, three, five thousand people. As you pass within five to ten feet of these beacons, you're able to identify where you were at any given point in time. The beacons don't signal, there's nothing being recorded when you leave the facility whether it's your smartphone or some other tool, a badge, whatever that's given to you, now you have technology applied in the workplace to be able to identify what the exposure was, what the risk was, all those sorts of things. So novel technology, it isn't that novel. This is, this is stuff that's been around for 10, 15 years. It's just a matter of how are you willing to think outside the box and apply it. Yeah, that was a great and very detailed answer. Thank you so much. That probably is becoming my trademark question, just like uh, Tim Ferriss is probably somewhat known for his, what's your morning routine? I'm going to spare asking you that question today, Dr. P Patil, but I, that may be in my next round, the next time in a couple of more months. As we're effectively at the home stretch, for those that would like to learn more uh, of the companies that you have built and are adapting to today's times and perhaps to simply want to understand more, even from an investing side of being a biotech investor, how could they learn more about your organization and reach out? Sure. Um, investors at cchealth.com. Um, we're happy to distribute the, the specific details. Uh, just succinctly, we are really focusing on addressing both the opportunity and the challenge of COVID-19 
focus specifically on both testing capacity as well as drug candidates, drug targets that appear to show incredible promise, uh, both for distribution outside the United States and should the opportunity present itself uh, in the United States. Again, I'll, I'll leave it specific at that particular point. We're also uh, engaging in discussions with state and county governments as well uh, to really put together return to work, reopen the economy programs that combine both testing as well as contact tracing and ultimately definitive treatment. Excellent. And on that note, everyone, uh, first I'll note again, today was fantastic. The doctor was amazing because we did discuss and it's very timely at the moment that we're doing this, but because podcasts kind of live forever, again, some of the information could be very, very different. I don't know, a day, a month, a year from now. So of course, on anything related to health, you need to deal with your personal physician. Things are changing rapidly. This is simply for informational purposes to provide an interesting, an interesting discussion. And similarly on investing, uh, it's something where you need to understand your goals, your risk tolerance, your time horizon. You should be an ultra, ultra, ultra high net worth individual doing these kind of more quote unquote alternative investments. So we all know the drill. Basically, you're responsible to do your own diligence, both on yourself with your health, as well as your portfolio. But we hope to have interesting guests, make it a lively debate and discussion to help up uh, I don't know if I quite use the word educate, but you could argue that, but to provide information that you're going to have to do your own diligence and research on. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office Podcast and founder and CEO of Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to highly successful families and their single family offices. I could be reached at familyofficeassociation.com. My direct email is angelo at familyofficeassociation.com. And we're extremely active on social media. And this will be produced as a video as well, uh, even before it becomes a podcast on my Apple and Spotify channels. And my YouTube for the video, our channel is Family Office. So that's Family Office channel or Family Office. You'll find it on YouTube. Uh, thank you so much to our live participants today. I thank you all that will see this on video or hear it on Spotify, Apple, or another platform. And of course, a special thanks to our special guest who was fantastic, Dr. Sanjay Patil. Doctor, thank you so much for appearing on our show today. Thank you so much, Angelo, and really, really appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion. Thank you. We appreciate your information. Thank Please you so be much. Safe.